and we can perfect there we go <laughs> perfect <sighs> so i think we haven't talked to each other since before covid have we i don't think we have talked to each other since before covid that's amazing <laughs> I know. That's why I was thinking that this would be an interesting conversation. What has it been like to be a constellation facilitator while COVID has been happening? Yeah. Why? Well, yeah. Do you want to start? Uh, sure. 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 Um, like a quick overview would be um, that I, that everything shifted to online for me. That I haven't that I haven't been out of my house except to grocery shop and. Uh, go to the doctors, uh, um, and most of the doctor appointments have been online uh, <laughs> since all this began. So, um, so everything's been online. So we started do we started doing drawings on the Zoom whiteboard, which has just been magical. But I'm but I miss people. Mm -hmm. What's it been like for you? Similar. I was in the middle of my training and. I just, my initial reaction was, well, that's it. I'm just abandoning the training. I can't carry on. <laughs> uh, and then a couple of wonderful men said, oh, don't worry. We'll sort you out. We'll get you back on line and all this sort of thing. So I was very resistant initially. Like, I don't want to be on line work. <laughs> um, but actually, I've been really pleasantly surprised at how much is possible online. It's incredible and how the computer becomes a friend and the field operates yeah. through the technology. It's just, it's, it is amazing. It's just not ceased to surprise me. So I've done five out of the 11 modules online. Wow. <laughs> and I mean, the, I've been really impressed by the trainees. They just fell in with it, you know, and got on with it. I mean, never facilitated before but there they were facilitating online yes. <laughs> and loving being representatives online and all sorts of things so yeah i'm delighted i mean having said that about two three weeks ago we met in person on the residential and then of course i realized how much we'd missed um so yeah i mean we adjusted we adapted online and it was fine and when we met in person, it was a whole other dimension, which was just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so um, mixture. Yeah. Is there any, are there any words you can put to the dimension that you discovered had been missing? Uh, I don't, it's not words. It feels like a wordless thing to do with mm. presence and, mm. Um, even though this online process has been so amazingly, surprisingly fantastic, there's just a whole other dimension that isn't there. Uh, and I don't know it isn't there until I get it. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, hugging, um, you know, we hugged and, yeah just standing near each other and all kinds of things. And that, you know, I'm sure it's things that we're not that conscious of, like smell, for instance, you know, smelling each other and this sort of thing. So definitely other dimensions that had gone unnoticed in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was really beautiful to come together and we found this amazing venue and, you know, all in nature. And, uh, so I'm going to do the whole of my next training at this new venue. So that was a good thing that came out of it. Oh, <laughs> and you, yeah. We were very, very able to, you know, adjust to what we needed and looked after us like nobody's business was just wow. incredible. Yeah. And have you been doing trainings online as well? Yes, um, busy, but I've been busier than I've ever been. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's very weird. The, the, um, I knew before COVID happened that I was using travel time as downtime. Mm -hmm. And then without travel time, then I'm, I just, I scheduled myself. But I also have been very... Um, very 
interested in a, a kind of a growing integration with it's been happening that did not happen right away, but started happening maybe in the last two or three months where it's starting to feel a little bit more like I know how to bring the spontaneity that I bring to live teaching to online teaching. Started to be able to kind of use the whiteboard as a as the drawing surface for that I usually use a you know a standing pad for and and um, and and have more of a sense of emergence and creativity and discovery. And I, I'm getting more and more picky about the way I put together my presentations. And like I'm spending so much time preparing for. Uh, in the beginning, I would just kind of slap stuff up there and go for it. And now I'm like, I really want this. I want this each time. I want it to be better. So it's been a really interesting and strange experience for me to to find myself, you know, both as being more scheduled and also just spending more time preparing. At the same time as being more creative. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's you a, find it's... the whiteboard okay, do you? Because I, I tried it once and I looked like a five-year-old writing on it. <laughs> it's just so shaky. I just thought, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not very good for me for, um, for writing words. But for drawing concepts, it's uh -huh. kind of it's kind of fun. Right. And then, and when you've been doing your online constellating, how what, what form has it taken for you? What how how do you have the representatives participate? How do you keep track of the constellation itself? What have you been doing? Mostly, I've used trainees as representatives online. Um, and that's been the the best for me. So I've done been doing quite a bit of work with uh, people in Q8, um, and she's really got to know my trainees, and they love it because they're having a different experience of different culture and that sort of stuff. So that's ninety percent of what I do. And then on the other occasions, if I work with an individual, I just ask them to choose objects in the room, mm. and as long as they can slant their screen. Mm -hmm. so that I can see the, the constellation, it works fine. But we just had an article in the journal from Stephanie Harton, don't know if you know her, where she's written all about online constellations and mm -hmm. how, they're, how they've taken off. Uh, and somebody sent me a whole range of choices about the different ways that you can work online. So I will look into that when I, when I get some time. <laughs> yes. I'm going yeah. to look at the different approaches and see if there's one that suits me. But I'm not sure about the whiteboard. I don't think that would be my preferred one. But there's um, also really strange ones, these figures that yeah. they're sort of 3D. That feels a bit surreal, too, too far out on the technology thing. Yeah. <laughs> Something yeah. a bit more in the middle would. And with, you know, Jan Jakob's got one that he's devised with the sort of the. You can move the outside circle around to show what direction they're looking in, that sort of stuff. So I'll, I'll experiment with that when I have some time, but I, I haven't done it recently. When you work with people, with your trainees being reps, just describe a little bit about how you set up the constellation and what, what how do you imagine movement happening or do they move in their screen or what? Yeah, what's they move in their own space. Uh, mm -hmm. So we just rename them. But, you know, obviously, I, I would always do a, a visualization anyway initially to help them get embodied, and then they just stand up where they are in the space that they're in. And initially, I was just doing it silently, and then I thought, no, that's not real enough. Put the sound on, um, mm -hmm. so they're all you know expressing themselves. And the weird thing is how it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this strange computer goes bing like that and somebody like the grandmother will be over this side of the screen and all of a sudden she's across the other side of the screen right over her granddaughter <laughs> I, find it, I find it incredible <laughs> or you know there's a couple and all of a sudden they're you know opposite sides of the screen they get pinged apart mm -hmm. <laughs> or somebody disappears their screen goes black you know and they've gone they've left the constellation it's just mm -hmm. so amazing just amazing how that works you know and there was one where this uh, that was the grandmother one there was a grandmother one and she had something black that was kind of dangling it was on the back of a chair and it looked like it was dangling over the screen and wrapping itself around the granddaughter <laughs> underneath mm -hmm. that's just <laughs> oh, just amazing amazing mm -hmm. yeah 
So that's that's how I work with it, don't they? Yeah. And people and then, putting their joining their hands and this sort of stuff, oh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, with the whiteboard, we've been people get to describe what shape they have. Like they don't even they don't have to be a person shape. They can be a starburst of energy or a flame or um, they can be an animal shape or a, so it's and they can become really big or really small. And so it's like it, it starts to involve all different kinds of movement and creativity that you, that's kind of got this different quality than than. Um, so it spreads wider actually, doesn't it? Like that. So are they drawing that themselves or are you doing it? Um, I either I'm doing it or somebody else. Uh -huh. uh, is is doing it while i'm facilitating right so they so just they, draw what they hear the client describe yeah yeah and what the representatives are telling them to do how do the representatives oh. change shape or size or or form or move in response yeah. to what's happening in the constellation wow amazing yeah. i'd love to see that live sometime I yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's very interestingly fun and i started out um really worried that i uh, if you if you just let me share my screen for a little minute i'll yeah, show you yeah. okay uh i think you have to make me a co-host in order for me to be oh, able yes, to of course. So I started out being really self-conscious about my drawing, which is not particularly good uh, in any kind of professional way, but I just started making little figures that had beak noses like birds so that we could tell, <laughs> tell where they were looking, you know, and then sometimes people are like, I need arms. <laughs> I just do the, abs the absolute minimum of, you know, like what, what do people say is going on and then uh and then things start to move and change what so, yeah like uh they get smaller or they get bigger or they they move or they turn around so <laughs> <That's lovely. laughs> Oh, you've kind of tempted me now to have another go. <laughs> it looks very steady, your writing. <laughs> Maybe that comes from practice, like ordinary writing, you know. Yeah, I can't. Well, well, writing words, it doesn't so much work for me. It's very, because it looks very primitive, but it's okay with bird, yeah, with well, bird people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <amazing>. and... <laughs> And different people make different kinds of figures, so it's kind of fun to see different people draw too. So are you are you doing this all over the world, or? Yeah, I mean, all right. over the world from my from my room here. <laughs> Have you not travelled at all? Have you travelled at all? No, my first in person time is scheduled for uh, the first week of August. I'll be at Omega Institute in New York State. Right, right. So it's quite a to travel across the continent for me, but I'm um, I'm just I'm very interested to get back. I'm interested. I'm I'm tantalized by this sense of like smell, like smell. <laughs> yeah, it's body, not conscious. It, I mean, yeah. mostly it's not conscious, but it it's yeah. there. I'm sure it's there. Yeah. So I don't know what the situation is in America. So when are you freed from lockdown and stuff? Then do you know? Well, right now there's not much lockdown happening. Right. There's some there's limitation of services. So restaurants have more limited hours than they used to, and there's limitation of of um, capacity. So rooms are legally allowed to hold far fewer people than they used to hold, and um, and um, yeah, uh, and in some states, they've just kind of given up on masks altogether. Uh, some places, they're still asking for masks. There's quite a lot of masking that's still happening in my area. But yeah. in the southern states, there's, there's much, much less. What's happening for you? 
Well, we're going from really extreme lockdown to to complete freedom on the 19th of July. Oh. There's real, real mixed responses, you know, yeah. in the government itself, but also amongst people. A lot of people are still really scared. Yeah. Um, and others are rebellious and all the rest of it. So it's a very interesting process. And my yeah. concern is we'll get locked down again in the winter. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Yeah. But we'll just have to wait and see, you know. So yeah, it's an interesting process, the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yes. Has COVID been showing up in your constellations? I've done, I think, three or four constellations which were actually about COVID. You know, we set it up as a blind constellation. Very interesting, really interesting. What kinds of things happen? Well, the most common thing is that the virus is always a friend oh. uh, and the pandemic is fear uh -huh. it's fear that would be kind of charging around amongst people and chaotic and all of this to it not the virus which mm. is interesting because it reminded me way back i did a group constellation that dan booth cohen was in and he represented a virus and of course it registered with me because i was so surprised by it and he said I'm completely benevolent, you know. <laughs> I feel like I'm in service and I'll stay until I'm no longer needed and then I'll leave. You know? I've never forgotten that. And oh. that was the feature in all of the constellations that I set up. Um, mm. there were, the fear was the, the predominant feature, the one that was charging around chaotically. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, there were, you know, other things like government and big pharma and these all powerful figures and that sort of stuff. But, but that was the, the one that was common to all of them. That the virus is not an enemy. It's a friend. Wow. We, yeah. we, ha I don't think I've done any that were just kind of like blind social issue constellations right. at that scale. But I have done a number of pieces of work for people who were um opposed to vaccination mm. who and who were kind of working to um to, to maybe to find their own center despite the center of public yeah. pressure being very different from theirs so um so images of walls keeping people apart uh, and yes, uh, very much about f like just being empowered to make your own decisions and find your own way yeah. in the middle of everything. I mean, I've been through that myself because I've not had the vaccination. And I mean, the, the, for me, the, the biggest plus of it is I get to experience what it's like to be in a minority. And I thought, wow, this is a really good education for me. Yeah. I'm not used to being the only one, you know. It made me have much more awareness of, you know, the only black person or the only lesbian or whatever it is. You know, mm -hmm. oh, this is what it feels like to be the only one. So I'm in a supervision group where there are six of us and I'm the only one who's not been vaccinated and three of the six don't want to see me anymore because mm. I'm not vaccinated. So experiences like that, you know, and my neighbors, you know, are so worried about me because I haven't had the vaccination. You know? And my brothers, same thing. You know? mm. <laughs> so it's a really interesting dynamic. Uh, yeah. And what I found with my brothers, particularly my older brother, I mean, we've had a conflictual relationship anyway, we had to say, okay, so if we're going to carry on seeing each other online, of course, then we have to agree not to talk about this. <laughs> because it just got too hot. You know? mm -hmm. And there was no meeting place, just nowhere in the middle where we could say, well, that's not true. What I did get to was I said, hang on a minute. You know what unites us? We love each other. Oh. I'm worried about you and you're worried about me and it's because we love each other. So let's just oh. stop trying to change each other <laughs> and just accept that that's what unites us, you know. So that helped. It helped yeah. a lot. So yeah. and occasionally he has another go, you know, are you, you sure you're not gonna get back there? I said, nope. <laughs> 
<laughs> let's not go there live and let live i mean that's been my sentence live and let live you know so i stopped trying to influence him and he's mostly stopped trying to influence me <laughs> but it's a real exercise isn't it in yeah. following your own truths and not trying to push that on other people yeah I mean, that's okay. the essence of it really isn't it yeah yeah and um I, I i'm going to omega institute and they require that everyone be vaccinated which actually is a relief for me because i have health conditions that make me even more vulnerable to right. long covid and to death <laughs> so like, um, but um but but when people discovered that the people in you know on my newsletter mailing list discovered that omega was requiring vaccination uh, they they write they write me these letters all caps don't you know that a child has just died from being vaccinated you know just like <laughs> but we found uh, um, we found a, a a retreat center in Sedona Arizona where they don't permit anyone on the grounds who has been vaccinated oh wow <laughs> <laughs> amazing <laughs> so we we have not sent out that as an answer we just try to be kind you know and you know just acknowledge people's um upset but but there's a part of me that wants to say and look into this retreat center because <laughs> you, you you might like it <laughs> i saw a hotel somewhere that said something similar you know mm. we don't want anybody staying here as they've been vaccinated <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. strange, it's like uh, it feels like there's two parallel realities going on it does so it weird does. and it's like if you stand in this reality your perception is this and if you stand in this reality your perception is this yeah it's like we're all in the same world how can we be seeing something so different oh, very differently and i think that's been part of the wall imagery yeah that's yeah. been appearing in the constellations yeah. And it kind of reminds me of the sort of divide and rule, you know, like, I mean, I'm thinking about Rwanda, you know, where this woman came to Germany and talked about the trauma in Rwanda. And she said, we were living next door to each other. We were the best of friends, Hutus and Tutsis, you know, and all of a sudden we were deadly enemies. What happened? Yeah. Bizarre, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and sure. it feels yeah. similar. Like, yeah. well, we were talking to each other before and we were all really good friends before what's happened that we now have all these arguments you know yeah. it's really weird really yeah. good. the bigger yeah, picture, you know there's such a mobilization um of of the disgust circuitry yeah. yeah it's being mobilized in so many different ways to manage populations yeah so so a lot of the anti-vax stuff is disgust based. Yeah. And a lot of the pro-vax stuff is disgust based. Interesting. I haven't seen that. Yeah. And then also in the United States with um with the critical race theory, <clears throat> which is uh which the way that I define critical race theory is the official definition, which is that w the integration of an understanding of the processes of enslavement into the whole history and current day politics of the United States uh -huh. and the ways in which the historical impact of, um, of structural racism has created so many disparities, including, you know, health differential, you know, different, different outcomes. If you get COVID, uh -huh. um, d diff yeah. different, uh, different the families you know a white family in the united states has 10 times the wealth that a black family has because of because of the structural racism black families were prevented from owning homes they were prevented from owning homes and from borrowing money just like so many there were so many elements prevented from having educations prevented from professional advancement just you just see it through you know as kind of a an incredible stream that goes through the whole of our U.S. society. And then um, there's been this backlash to an understanding of this. Uh -huh. 
and the backlash is coming out with Fox News having uh, made 1,047 references, negative references to critical race theory, of the way that they're using the words in you know in the last month alone. I mean, it's like a it's like a propaganda push, and so I'm getting letters and emails from Europeans who are saying, I don't agree with you on critical race theory. And I'm like, how are you defining critical race theory? Because if you're defining it as being able to look at the impact of enslavement and structural racism, I don't understand how you could object to it. But you're right. defining it, yeah, you're defining it in a different way. And this again is the mobilization of disgust. And it's so pervasive that it's leaving the US and it's traveling to Europe and then coming back from Europe with people saying, Sarah, I don't agree with you on critical race theory. And I'm like, wait. wait. Astounding, isn't it? Yeah. And has that been propelled forward by COVID, do you think? Or is it another parallel <laughs> process with Black Lives Matter? <laughs> um, well, that makes me laugh because we've all been trapped with our televisions. <laughs> Tell you what, I gave up watching the news about six months ago. You know, I, I think I, that's I, very wise. Re-traumatizing me every time I watch it. <laughs> I'm not doing this. <laughs> Good move. Good move. Uh, not yeah, my but, health. <laughs> I mean, they're starting to do uh, research now, looking at the effect of Fox News on brains. Yeah. You know, because it's a it's a relentless barrage of disgust. Yeah. yeah. And people end up in sympathetic activation that they are not getting out of. They just stay in it. That's and when what's you, happening for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is BBC. That's our equivalent, isn't it? Right. Right. And I just thought, I don't, I don't need this bombardment of trauma no. every single day. No, no. I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <No>. click. <laughs> no. Very good. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah. At least we have the option to turn it off. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, COVID feels interwoven with it simply because, in a way, at least in the United States, people have become a captive audience for disgust. Right. Um, and at least it's interesting, I think. You know, I mean, once your disgust circuitry is activated, there's like meaning. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an interesting feeling, isn't it? Disgust. I remember when I was doing my gestalt training, we had to, we were given a tray of food uh, and we had to take all these pieces of food and chew them until they were liquid, until we activated the disgust reflex. Very oh. interesting. Really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Very like eventually it gets to the point where you can't swallow you know yeah. yeah yeah spew up basically <laughs> did they want you to be able to recognize it and yes it was an awareness exercise to recognize what disgust feels like you know joining mm -hmm. the kind of emotional and the and the physical response together yeah mm -hmm. it's very good i've never forgotten it yeah yeah and of course it's so uh, important when it shows up in constellations yeah, absolutely. Yeah, more uh, hard to digest. Yeah, hard to digest things that, that yeah. can't be, that shouldn't be inside of us, that have been yeah. brought inside of us. Yeah. The need to get things out that have been in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, lot of, a lot of stuff, isn't it? Mm. And I think, you know, I see that in children, in my grandchildren, you know, they somehow are bombarded, you know, and they sort of come home from school and they're kind of, you know, talk about oh. overstimulation, you know, oh. it's just crazy. It's like far too much input. Oh, yeah. Quite, and not enough that way, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking maybe I need to train them to feel their disgust and, you know, express oh, it. What a good idea. Yeah, yeah, to have it go in that direction instead of always in this direction, you know. Yeah. But that's the, I mean, that in a way is the trend of how society is, isn't it? It's all input and there's not much space for output. Yes, and that's, I think, one of the beautiful things about Constellations Online. Yeah. Is that you stop 
the screen stops being just a download device. It becomes a, um, a two-way yeah, interactive. communication. Yeah, interactive instead of just the downloads. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen Porges, who's one of my favorite neuroscientists um, and who studies the vagus nerve, he, at the beginning of COVID, he said, we all need to understand that with all the time we're going to be spending on on a flat screen, that we need to start to let ourselves feel both that we are that we are actors and receivers. Uh -huh. That there's that there's a, a a transmission both ways that's happening instead of just going into passive reception mode right. to let ourselves. Because I try to understand his his theory about the Vegas if I haven't got it yet. I, well, I, I thought of you actually because I thought, okay, who's the person who's most been able to translate into understandable English for me? <laughs> All this brain stuff. I'll, I'll ask Sarah. Maybe she can translate it for me. Because I this this whole lecture, and I thought. Do you know, I still don't really get what the Vegas step is about. So can you give me a summary in a few minutes? Sure. I think I can. I yeah. just love it so much. So the vagus nerve is this huge, well, it's not huge, but it's quite an it's got quite an effect. It's a it's a it's a channel of nerves that runs in front of the spinal column and behind the heart. So in that oh, okay. space between. Right. And 80% of its fibers go to the brain. We always think that we're creating our reality but with our brain, but really our body is creating our reality and our brain is making is pretending that it's got some control. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, I know I'd love to show that to my son. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the our body our torso our guts our heart our, our our sexual organs are telling us like what is it like to be in this world is it hopeless is it alarming or is everything good and do, are we safe together and can we relax right. and those are the three states hopeless alarming and uh, or, or this can also be exciting hopeless, alarming, or exciting, or just like relaxed and together and bonded and connected and safe. And most of the time in our world, we live in alarm. <laughs> and it's still to do with the Vegas nerve. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, we, so the Vegas like, nerve travels up to the amygdala, does it? Is that what happens? Yes, yes, okay. it does. It travels up to the brainstem, and then it gives all kinds of information to the amygdala right okay yeah and then and then that still isn't the end of it because we have to actually give words to our experience in order to close the circuits words or some kind of communication so right. it could be like it doesn't have to be words like you could tell me um that you were exhausted and i might go Whew. and that would be like enough right there would be a reflection over here in response to your exhaustion oh, yeah. And in some way that would complete the circuit. Right. But if, if nobody ever resonates with us, those, the vagus nerve just kind of stays in whatever state it's in, whether that's immobilization or fight, flight, alarmed, aloneness. And of course, our constellation work transforms, uh, transforms our experience toward the relaxation and engagement. Right. So I'm trying to imagine this vagus nerve. So is it lots of kind of little fibers or is it one big thing? It's, or? it's apparently about the diameter of a pencil. A and pencil? It's thickest. A pencil, yeah. Oh, goodness, right. Yeah, okay. and, and it's got offshoots that run like to the heart and to the lungs, uh -huh. to the stomach, to the diaphragm, to the intestines, little little. Little watery, fibery thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it kind of runs up the length of the spine, does it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from uh, the lowest part that it's innervating is the reproductive organs, sexual organs, whoosh, and then up. It's like the chakras. It's, it's the, right. the plexus of the nerves, the, the, big, the big bodies of nerve bundles are in the chakra areas. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you make it sound so simple. <laughs> you know, I. Uh, you need to be a hero of Stephen Forges <laughs> because you can make sense of it in a way that I don't think he is able to. You know. <laughs> we had a summit this year. We did a um, a resonance summit, and um, and we. Um, and and I had him speak for us. I did an interview of him. Yeah, and he, he's you know he's a brainiac, so he would speak, and I would like, oh my god, oh my god! First of all, make sense of this, and second of all, translate it and make it usable information for the audience. And actually, I it was very intense. I love him very much, but it was very intense. And at the end, I just wept. I, I mean, not with him. I went to, I went to my bathroom. And I just crumpled on the floor and I wept because I was channeling so much energy. I bet you were, my goodness. That's what we've just been talking about, you know, it's all coming inward and yeah. going back the other way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, but he's really, um, one of the, one of the things I love him the most for is something that you and I may have talked about before, but, um, is that he's the one who said and created the research that very clearly proves that unless you, that we can't tell if another person is giving their their consent unless they say a verbal yes that that yeah so for, for in terms of sexual assault and um, it, and uh, date rape and you know all that stuff that happens th there's no way to assume a silent consent. We cannot assume a silent consent because it might be immobilization. It might be the hopelessness yeah, because that, frozen, being frozen. For, yeah, exactly. For 30 to 40% of people, um, if they start to be overpowered socially or physically, then their body shuts down and they don't have any capacity to respond. They have lost their, right. they've lost their verbal no. Wow. That makes and, sense. That resonates yeah. with me, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And wow. so many people, of course, blame themselves for not being able to respond mm. in a situation where they're being pressured into something they don't want to do. But once we start to understand this, then so much more compassion comes. And also the legal stuff becomes much clearer. Yeah. Like, and yeah. the, the Swedish parliament, in response to his research, actually made it into law. They were the first to make it into law. I haven't tracked who else has. But in Sweden, you, ha you have to get a verbal yes or, or it's Very basically, or it's basically rape. Yeah. I'm just thinking about that in terms of childhood, you know, and parenting and the kind of, a, oh, my children are defiant, you know. Oh, yes. <laughs> in other words, they're not allowed to say no. Right. So they don't learn about saying right. no. I mean, that was certainly true for me. I didn't learn to say no. I didn't know I could say no, you know. And I had right. all kinds of experiences, you know, that were about that very thing. Like, yeah. I, I had, it wasn't part of my way of being to say no. No. So mm. it's interesting, isn't it? You need to sort of think about it in terms of parenting and we see that as an affront on us as a parent you know yes you instead know, of celebrating yeah you. i know <laughs> i dare my child say no to me you know but actually it's healthy if they yeah. do yeah and i have tried you know i've learned much more about from being a grandmother you know <laughs> trying to get this across <laughs> When my, when my particular my daughter goes, oh, you know, they do this, they're friendly, they won't do this, they won't do that. I said, be grateful, be grateful. You know, they've got some spirit. They're able to say, no, I won't. You know. right. <laughs> but we'll stand them in good stead later on. You know. So, no kidding. It's really interesting yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. And we also brought Deb Dana to the summit because she's, uh, oh, she's no. his she's she wrote the book the polyvagal theory and therapy so oh. she's a she's a translator right. yeah and she's a little easier to to get than he is she's, <laughs> she's, <Deb -dana. laughs> she's slightly less polysyllabic um deb dana d-a-n-a -A. Dana, D -A -N -A. dana yeah yeah okay oh, yeah. Look out for her. yeah so she written books has she yes Oh, the polyvagal theory and therapy, right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So you're still on your um, brain trajectory, are you? Yeah. Yeah. This morning before we met, I was working on um, Beatrice Beebe uh, as research, who I always work on very slowly because I get so upset when I read it. Um, she's the one who did the the facial expressions of babies mm -hmm. um, and how they become their they pick up their mom's facial expression vocabulary completely by the time they're four months old. Yeah, I've quoted and, that. So, so yeah. times you're saying that. Yeah, yeah, incredible, isn't it? Yeah. So this morning I was working on trying to understand the dimensions that she's perceiving attachment happening in. Mm -hmm. So attachment is happening in the dimension of time. Like how quickly do we respond to each other? What are the small nonverbal responses that you make when I'm speaking and that I make when you're speaking? How quickly do we, you know, how much, and then contingency, how much do we stay with each other as mm -hmm. we're talking? And, um, and uh, space, and you can tell this less on Zoom, but like, how close do we move to each other? How, how far away do we move from each other? And what's happening with facial expressions? So there are all these dimensions of rhythmicity and response that become embedded to a degree that's very unconscious. Yeah. Like, we carry within us a certain pattern of what feels most familiar, most comforting, and then we carry that on into our adult lives. And then we end up choosing people who have the rhythms that are most familiar. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what I'm... Yeah. Yeah, that's I what mean, I've been wrapping my brain around. You know, in with Zoom, I, I'm, I mean, I haven't measured it, but I'm imagining we get closer than we would in the in the flesh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in terms of like yeah. nose to nose, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Measure yeah. the distance from me to you now. In yeah. the flesh, we wouldn't stand that close. I'm yeah. sure we wouldn't. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? And I've yeah. been thinking also about babies and all these masks, you know. How is it for a baby to grow up not seeing from the nose down, you know? Yeah, the, from the cheekbones up, this is the part of our face that's most um, involuntarily responsive, though. Is it? It's, okay. Yes, it's the part that's telling us whether or not people are authentic. Is oh, if, wow. the, if the upper part of their face matches the lower part of their face, because wow. this, is, this is the authentic part. Uh-huh. And this is the socially controlled part. Oh, that's really fascinating. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've looked at sometimes at images of murderers, you know. Yeah. And when you look in the eyes, it's like they're missing somehow. The soul mm. is missing in some mm. way. It's this kind of strange, you know, like you could go that like that across their eyes and there would be no response, you know. Mm -hmm. So do you think that starts very young, very early, maybe? um absolutely um, absolutely yeah the f she's measuring babies at the first four months of life and she says by the time babies are six months old they are um they have this internalized sense of which rhythmicity is is right what? yeah yeah and is it upsetting because of the effect of not not getting that rhythm rhythmicity or what makes it upsetting um that there are different things that upset me with the different <laughs> things that i learn um one of the things that upset me that upsets me regularly when i'm reading it is i'm like i can tell that that what i wished i had been able to do with my baby uh, i didn't okay. get to do right it's like there's so much regret um, like yeah. the talking about facial mobility and I know that I know my face was immobile I mean right. it was still when I had my boy I mean my, the majority of my healing and my aliveness has come in the last 15 years and my boy is 23 so that's eight years before I even started to unfreeze mm -hmm. you know and so there's so you know there's all those kinds of regrets mm -hmm. and, and 
um, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, that uh, really kind of sinks me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not that you. Can do oh, it, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna stop reading this for six months. <laughs> I <Let> self recover. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've said to my daughter a hundred times, you know, awareness is such a mixed bag, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are times when I think, oh, I wish I didn't know this, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what you don't know about, you can't do anything about, you know, but once you no. know about it, it's like, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't unknow it, can you? Once no, you've got you can't that unknow it, yeah. So she a lot of books then Beatrice yeah, she has that. like six I think six books uh -huh. right. mm -hmm. I was in contact with her I'm trying to get her for next year's summit um, I was in contact with her and she's like I said oh I'm reading your book she said which ones I'm like, all of them <laughs> I have all of them I'm about a third of the way through all of them <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so you're still you're still a neuroscience geek are you <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Unrepentant. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Do you need like an hour a day or I mean, how do you manage to find the time? You know, it was an hour a day. I used to kind of at breakfast, I used to kind of just like take that time and eat and read research papers. And now um, with this sort of whole new thing that's taking over with the new desire to work on my slides and make things better and better and better um, and the level of correspondence that I'm in I actually for the first time have a researcher who helps me wow yeah yeah it's wonderful she just helps me for the monthly uh, neuroscience and resonance webinar series mm -hmm. so last month she was helping me look for articles that would help explain toxic positivity and spiritual bypassing. And that was fun. Excellent. Wow. Yeah. And this month I'm looking at what is the latest research uh, showing stuff about cortisol. What are the, what, what is, what have the last two years of investigations of cortisol started to show us? Well, how do I get to join this webinar series then? Um, you'd have to watch it in recording because it happens at night in the U.S., which means it's 3 a.m. for you. Oh. But you... <laughs> <laughs> I have tried that once or twice. No, 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 <laughs> no. So the folks who like them in the U.K. generally watch the recording, which, right. you know, sometimes people watch recordings and sometimes people need things to be live. Okay, so uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to get on your yeah list for that so maybe just send okay. me the link yeah because sure sure It'd be fun yeah and anything new happening with the journal anything you want to say about we've yeah. revamped the website um try to make it more accessible um francesca is amazing i mean she's relentless in her support and always has been you know so she said simplify simplify the website <laughs> make it easier to get in so we've tried to do that. And I mean, it was so interesting. The whole thing seemed to conspire against us because I was trying to get it ready for, first of all, for the Australasian intensive, wasn't ready. Then for the ISCA, wasn't ready. I was like, what message are you trying to give me out there, you know? <laughs> so it's ready now. Oh, good. So what I've done is make everything available for a one-off fee which is renewable oh. once a year. Oh, so that seems to be much simpler. And then I'm getting, I'm gathering bundles. So with the help of my daughter, who's my assistant, we're just going through all the articles and gathering them in along themes, you know. So we have a Sarah Payton bundle. We haven't got, oh. wait, we wait till we get 10 articles. So I need a few oh. more articles. Oh, from. we do need some more articles, yeah. <laughs> and once we get to 10, then we have a, we have a bundle so people can just take a bundle of Sarah Payton or whoever it is, you know, oh, or whatever it is. It might be a theme yeah. of trauma or something yeah. like that instead. So, you know, if they just want a specific subject. Um, so, yeah, so definitely we're, we're changing. But, you know, I had a meeting with um, 
three or four of the young were you in the ISCA gathering can't remember yes yeah yeah so the you know the young people the translators amazing vibrant translators wonderful um so they were talking about translating the journal into various languages and whatnot and the this guy victor did you meet victor from no. spain or can't remember spain or brazil brazil anyway spanish speaking and uh, oh mexico i think it was and he said you know you need to get up to date with what young people do these days <laughs> so i said what do you mean he said no young person reads a hundred page journal <laughs> <laughs> coming out twice a year no you need regular little drops once a mm -hmm. month small chunks so I said, okay i'll have a think about that so i haven't done anything about it yet but i did think maybe i do need to get myself up to date you know mm -hmm. that actually reading 100 pages twice a year is not the way you do it these days you, re mm -hmm. you read 20 pages 12 times a year you know yeah yeah, very interesting. So it is interesting, isn't it? And I mean, I'm so kind of like this with Facebook and all this sort of stuff. I was like, oh, I don't want to do Facebook or Twitter or, you know, <laughs> rejecting, rejecting, rejecting. And I think, well, you know, you would have rejected Zoom a couple of years ago and now here you are <laughs> using it, you know. But I can't quite bring myself to be, <laughs> you know, on the Facebook <laughs> thing i mean i'm on there but my daughter does it for me you know so it's over there yeah. so i don't know if i can quite bring myself up to date with all this stuff but you know he certainly got me thinking and i thought well maybe i do need to do something along those lines yeah. Yeah. but it's knowing how or what and when yet you know i'm still waiting for some petty to drop so how that process might happen so i mean you know, progress is progress, isn't it? You do have to adjust or you or you sink. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I might stubbornly sink or, or I might right. yes. Claiming our right to stubbornly sink. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, we just have a few more minutes and I want to ask one last question, which is, have you found that the kind of COVID lockdown more isolation have you found what have you found that it has changed for you what how has it been for you personally mixed really mixed yeah in some ways it's really wonderful to have more space and you know it sounds crazy but i don't have to do my housework so often you know <laughs> i can kind of wash up less often <laughs> this sort of thing um so i feel i do feel more spacious in my everyday life and I don't realise how much I miss company until I have it. Mm. So definitely some isolation, but yeah. I've adapted, you know, and then I meet with friends and I go, oh, that's uh, what I've been missing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a real mixed bag for me. Yeah. What about you? It's been, um, I I've had a huge health journey, right? When COVID started, I had a huge health scare. Uh -huh. like lots of like in like MRIs and just like all, all kinds of things trying to figure out what was wrong I had an, an soaringly high scarily high blood pressure all of a sudden wow. and so it's just been it's it's given me time to really kind of sink into self-care and to work on my workaholism <laughs> so, <laughs> so that I'm just like bringing much more gentleness and uh and this idea of consent even with myself like do i actually consent to work right now or do i want to am i willing to is there any opening in me to do this stuff that whatever i'm doing instead of like driving myself like a nail and a hammer you know yeah so. that's, that's wonderful you do seem yeah. more relaxed in yourself yeah yeah so, definitely yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I could certainly learn some things about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I don't know if this is true for you, but I find when I enjoy what I do, it's much harder to slow down. Yeah, you know, yeah I don't it's true. Admin, then, yeah. then I could say, <laughs> I was going to swear then, but you know, <laughs> be done with it, you know, <laughs> or whatever. But when I really enjoy it, that's yeah. when I 
I find it really hard to slow down because I want to be doing what I'm doing. You know, it nourishes me. Yeah. So it's difficult then, you know, it's a mm. kind of, it's like eating a cream cake, you know. I mean, the cream cake is delicious. I might know it's not good for me, but it's delicious. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so mm. finding that balance is tricky, isn't it? Yeah. You've managed it by the sound of it. Say that again? You've managed to slow yourself down, have you? Yes, well a done. little. Yeah, it's quite nice. That part and do you, really how do you do that? Is a sort of constant awareness checking with yourself? Do I want to be doing this right now? How how you manage? Yeah, that? like a little bit, like uh, a bit of warm reassurance. Like, hey, Sarah, do you remember that this is a rest time? You get to rest now. You know? <laughs> like talking to your inner child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can feel that. Well, I'm so glad to have gotten to see you. Yeah. Here. Thank you. And thank you for the prompt. You know, yeah. you were, you're always in the back of my mind, you know, so mm -hmm. it's really nice to have you come forward again. And let's yeah. talk again soon. Maybe not uh, two years' time, a bit more. <laughs> exactly. A, a bit soon. more than that. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, All right. Many hugs to you. I look forward to hugging in person. Yeah. Bye bye.